Welcome to Cyber Focus, your source for international business information. I'm your host, Ryan Craven, and our guest today is Professor Larita Killian. Currently a professor of business at Indiana University in Columbus, Larita teaches financial accounting, intermediate accounting, and governmental and nonprofit accounting. Her research interests are special district governments and accounting pedagogy. Larita grew up on a farm in northern Indiana. Her first career was with the U.S. Department of Defense, where she spent nearly 31 years and retired as a financial analysis. Maria also served in the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve. She has a bachelor's from University of Colorado and her master's and doctoral degrees are from Stanford. She's currently a CPA, a certified governmental financial manager, and a Fulbright specialist in business. Well, Loretta, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, we'll go ahead and kind of jump right into it. Uh, so what do you think that's important for faculty uh, specifically business faculty, to take advantage of those FDIBs, those international business development opportunities. Right. Well, you know, supposedly we're preparing our students to succeed in an interconnected world. And I don't think that interconnected world is going to go away. I think we may have some adjustments to how globalization has operated over the last couple decades. I think we're in for some reckoning and a couple adjustments. But interconnectedness is not going away. And uh, for our students to succeed in an interconnected world, they have to know something about it and how people in other countries perceive the United States, for instance, how they perceive trade with the United States. And the best way for us as faculty to learn those things is to visit other countries and meet business people elsewhere. So we really know what they're thinking when we discuss international issues with our students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the current situation uh, my perspective and, and some of the conversations I've had and, and you're fortunate enough to have has really showcased the the nature of everything, the entire you know world and education and business is so much more connected than I think a lot of folks really understand. Right. So, um, so you had the opportunity to go on an, an FDIB um, and I believe you went to Bolivia? I certainly did. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And I can. I'd love to. Um, I've been very fortunate. I've made three working trips to Bolivia. By the way, I loved it so much, I made a fourth trip just for fun. No work, just to explore the country. But I had three great working trips. Um, I worked there with a university called Universidad Privada Boliviana, or Private University of Bolivia, which, by the way, IU helped implement. Like back in the early 70s, a couple IU professors went to Bolivia to consult with the group setting up this new university. So it was kind of fun to reestablish with this university after all these years. Um, so I've been there three times. I've done a variety of things. I've worked in three different cities there. I work because they have campuses in different cities. Yupay Bay has campuses in Cochabamba, La Paz, and Sucre. So I've worked in all three of those cities. Um, the most time, the most time consuming work I've done there is conducting workshops, longer workshops for like faculty and students. And those works two different types. One was a course development workshop for faculty. I also have conducted um, workshops on qualitative research for both faculty and graduate students. So that's my longest time commitment there. I've also conducted shorter seminars for like working people, like people who work at local nonprofits or um, some local business people. And those seminars were on topics such as internal controls and also financial reporting for nonprofits. Um, another type of thing I've done there, whenever I visit, you know, they like to keep up their alumni connections. So when I'm there, if time allows, I, I may go to different cities and meet with some Upe Bay alumni. And the, the thing I've discussed most with them is globalization. We've talked about the impacts of globalization, the social impacts, for instance. And um, so that's three types of things I've done there. And then something unique I did was in 2019, Upe Bay was hosting a Latin American business conference. And I was invited to go and be a keynote speaker there. So that was kind of fun. So those are the types of, of work I've done in Bolivia. Yeah, perfect. And and, you know, when you go to Bolivia and you're teaching all these different topics, um, what's some of, the, some of the extra work or what do you have to learn to take into account for different cultures, different countries do business and policies in a different way? 
Yes, they certainly do. Uh, well, I, I can tell you something that may sound trivial, but actually it's not at all trivial when you're there. And um, actually that is the air kiss. You know, we do air kisses. Everyone wants to kiss you. I, you know, unfortunately, I didn't know about air kisses before I arrived at the proper way to do this, but it's something that happens a lot. It's part of their culture and it's something you need to know. Um, they use some of the same technology we do. So like in the, in the presentations I was doing there, whether it was the workshops or the seminars or whatever, they have pretty much the same kind of support technology we do here for our courses and workshops. So that was kind of similar. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, us as a cyber center especially try to reinforce with folks is that you really should, and it behooves you to do a little bit of that research on some of those, you know, cultural nuances before you even get, um, you know, arrive in country. Uh, uh, a gentleman that we had talked to earlier in the year, uh, Jeremy Williams does consulting for um, really businesses all across the world. He's based out of the UK and doing how to do business in and with, you know, kind of the Arab world. And, and one of his key points was absolutely, they can tell when you've done a little bit of homework to understand the culture and understand the perspective. Mm -hmm. And that changes the tone of the conversation in just extremely positive ways. And it, it shows that you've, that you care and you've done that work. Um, so, um, coming through and, and selling or pitch, pitching your idea um, and it, your ideas alone is good enough to buy it. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's something I've improved on over time, I'm glad to say. Um, I haven't made a study of the Spanish language formally, but during my repetitive trips there, fortunately, I've, I've picked up more of the lingo so I can converse with people who aren't real good in English. You know, most of the time, the official language of the campus is English, but some people there are not real comfortable with English. So I, I'm certainly not a Spanish speaker per se, but I've managed to pick up enough of it that I can communicate on a basic level with a lot of people, which I couldn't do at first. That's something that's developed over time. Yeah, absolutely. What, what was something that surprised you most about uh, your time in Bolivia? My introduction to Bolivia was through the Fulbright program. I won a Fulbright Specialist Award to go to Bolivia. So my first trip was kind of preliminary, just to set the stage and explore what would be beneficial for my longer follow-up Fulbright assignment, which came in 2017. When I first, you know, was, was given this, this award and project and started working on it, I knew that I'd be learning from them. I knew that it's about mutual learning. I knew that one of the reasons I'm going there is to learn from them and about their culture things that would benefit me and benefit my students. But I also thought that I would, I would be helping them in some way. I, frankly, I thought that was the purpose. I thought part of the purpose of a Fulbright program is you're helping to develop the capacity in the other country. So I knew I'd learn from them. I also thought I might help them. What I learned very quickly was they don't need help. I was really surprised at how sophisticated they are. Now, Bolivia is a poor country. There are many poor country people there. Bolivia is one of the poorest countries in South America. Many people there have a very meager existence. So, you know, countrywide, you know, they have a different social economic situation than we do. But I was surprised at how sophisticated and how creative, you know, the university is and the faculty are, you know, they don't need quote unquote help. Um, Fortunately, they're happy to collaborate, and I've enjoyed collaborating with them very much, and that continues in other ways, for which I'm very grateful. But I learned very quickly they don't need help. It seems like that's always, got, that's always the question that, that seems to pop up, or that's not the first time I've heard that, that sentiment or that mentality is, yeah. we are coming here because you need our help, because of X, Y, or Z, yeah. Yeah. and... Most people and countries and populations are a lot more similar than they are different. Probably. What, uh, what drew you to Bolivia? Frankly, I was invited to go there. Um, 
I didn't choose it. And it was a wonderful, pleasant surprise for me. I've traveled quite a bit. I've, I've traveled worldwide. I've, I've been in many parts of this world. Uh, I made several trips to Asia, for instance, not even to mention Europe, but I never previously traveled to South America. I just didn't think it sounded that appealing to me. I'm sorry, I just never thought about it that much. That's, that's the truth. But I was asked to go there as a Fulbright specialist. And as I said, I absolutely fell in love with it. So, so much so that I made an extra trip for myself just to enjoy the place, enjoy the people and their society and their culture. So frankly, it was a pleasant surprise. Um, I applied for the Fulbright Specialist Program, and once you're approved, you're on this list, and then countries can recruit you. You know, they can come to you, they can make a proposal and say, we'd like you to come here and do this. And I received a proposal to go do some work in Bolivia, and what a wonderful surprise. Yeah, it seems like uh, oftentimes travel turns out that way. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the value of that experience and then just really any of your national experience it has on, you know, really yourself and, um, you know, your classroom and the students that you are teaching? I've learned some things that I think are, are helpful and useful for my students. One of the things I've learned is in, in several places I've been, those people, they're quote unquote hungry and they're determined. You know, I've been in many places where people are poorer than we are here in the United States on average, where they're poor, but they're not dumb. They're very smart and they're very hardworking and they're very entrepreneurial. The entrepreneurial spirit in these countries is very strong, but sometimes they have nothing else. You know, they don't have the business infrastructure. They don't have the sophisticated government infrastructure that, that we enjoy. So what are they going to do? They have to create something for themselves. Very strong entrepreneurial spirit there. So you know, I think it's useful for me to see that and witness it and, and discuss it with my students because they're going to be competing with that. You know, anyone who hasn't witnessed that may not understand basically what we're competing with worldwide. And also it's had some very specific benefits to my students. For instance, as a result of my work with this Bolivian faculty, I jointly created an exercise. You know, I wanted something that we could do together. I wanted something that I could do with my courses and the Bolivian faculty could do with their courses. Now there's many things that are not the same. For instance, accounting standards. Um, accounting setting standards, accounting bodies work, you know, they're not the same. We don't have the same reporting formats, you know. So we, there's a lot of things we couldn't do. So I developed an ethics exercise. I say I developed, we developed. It was developed collaboratively between myself and my counterparts in Bolivia so that we could do it in both places on, you know, different campuses. And um, it's a wonderful exercise. It gives my students an opportunity to go, you know, leave the campus and go interview working professionals about the ethical challenges they faced in their day-to-day -day work lives. Also gives them the chance to discuss, you know, aspects of accounting-related careers, you know, with real working professionals that they might not otherwise have this opportunity. It's a wonderful opportunity for my students. They really appreciate it. The students in Bolivia appreciate it. It's, it's been very popular. And that literally, that exercise, one of the most valuable parts of the semester would not exist if there weren't this desire to create something collaborative between, you know, myself and my counterparts in Bolivia. Yeah, fantastic. And I can certainly appreciate the, the ethics are somewhat universal, that perspective. We worked with, with different students from a lot of, you know, various countries and, and brought them to the U.S. and and whenever we talk about ethics, that fundamental line is typically the same, but it's interesting to see the subtle shifts and perspectives based on their home countries. No, you're absolutely right. You know, ethics is a universal concern. The answers don't always the same, but it's very much, you know, the questions are pretty similar, even though the answers may vary. But we did discover as a result of what my students learned, what the Bolivian students learned, a lot of commonality. You know, when they go interview business people in Bolivia, some of the topics and concerns they come back with are the same things that my students come back with. Well, and, and I think, uh, I can only imagine your students probably certainly appreciate all the international and, and the experience that you bring. You know, you have those conversations. You probably inadvertently open up their thoughts to working abroad in different cultures that 
um, and you know, if they had a, a teacher that hasn't traveled as much or had that experience, um, might not really kind of foster that, that mindset or that growth. Well, I certainly hope so. That's the idea. <laughs> That's it for this edition of Cyber Focus. For future topics or comments, please send us a note at cyber at indiana.edu.